Thank you very much, Philip, and uh, thanks to the Mortimer History Society uh, and the Radnish Society for the invitation um, to speak and for organising this conference. Uh, and it's great to finally be here after two years uh, of being postponed due to COVID. So thank you so much for uh, the invitation. Uh, hello, my name is Rhian Emlyn. I'm one of the speakers in, uh, today. Uh, and in my paper, in my lecture, I talk about uh, the relationship between uh, Llewellyn Ab Yorwerth, Llewellyn the Great, uh, and the Mortimers, uh, and especially uh, the conflict, but also the coexistence that existed between Llewellyn and the Marchers. Um, and so we'll be thinking about the context, we'll be thinking about this conflict, uh, but also we'll be thinking about what we can learn by looking at, at the conflict between Llewellyn and the Mortimers in the region of Milianiv. Now, I've been asked to come here today to speak uh, about uh, Llewellyn Ab Yorwerth, um, or Llewellyn the Great, uh, and his relationship with the Mortimers. Now, usually, um, a disclaimer, I'm, I'm usually a historian of 14th and 15th century uh, in Wales, looking at the church uh, and looking at uh, scholars, and I'm very aware that I'm sandwiched between uh, David Stevenson, I can't see where he is at the moment, David, uh, and Philip, who obviously uh, have um, specialised much more on the themes of this conference. But I am very glad of the opportunity to speak about Llewellyn uh, the Great, such a highly uh, dominant, significant figure in 13th uh, century Wales, and generally in Wales of the Middle Ages. And to give my impressions of what we can learn uh, by looking at the history of both conflict and coexistence between Llewellyn and the Mortimers, I probably should make clear as well at this point that although I've said conflict and coexistence, it is mainly conflict. <laughs> uh, but there is some coexistence there uh, as well. So, um, for the purpose of this lecture, then, um, I'm following in the traditions of Eirin here. Uh, so, obviously, we've been brought up in the same tradition. I have three different things I want to cover uh, during the course of this lecture. Um, I want to begin by giving some context, uh, first of all, to this conflict between Llewellyn Ab Yorwer, Llewellyn the Great, and the Mortimers. I will then want to go into this conflict and outline this conflict between them. And then at the end, to think about what we can learn by thinking about this conflict. First of all then, um, I want to give you some context to uh, the main characters that are gonna figure quite prominently in this lecture. Uh, and apologies for all the names and all the dates that you see here, and you'll see for the rest of the slide uh, as well. So some of these need no introduction. I'm sure the Mortimers need no introduction, especially uh, to the Mortimer History Society. Um, but the Mortimers that will be the focus of this lecture uh, are these individuals, so Roger uh, and his sons, Hugh uh, and Ralph, uh, this important dynasty. And of course then we have the other important dynasty in Mylienid, or in this area, Shungui Havren, between the Y and the Seven, um, that David mentioned in his uh, lecture. The dynasty of Cadwallan of Madog, who's such a fascinating figure, um, and um, I look forward at some point to hearing more about him um, from David. Um, his son, uh, Howell, uh, and then his grandsons, Madog, Cadwallan, and Meredith Ap Milgun, son of Milgun. So those are the um, representatives of the dynasty, uh, of the native dynasty of Mylianid uh, that are going to be figure in this uh, lecture. Um, and of course, these two dynasties, these two families, as we've already heard, had what we might call uh, a private feud um, going over a century um, between them. Um, and this is what we've already heard uh, from David. But as we enter the 13th century, there is int increasing interference from other powers, other figures of authority. And in particular, the man you see, uh, his name at the bottom of this slide, uh, Llewellyn Ab Yorweth, Llewellyn the Great Prince 
of Gwynedd. Uh, and so I'll introduce him uh, and uh, give a quick in uh, overview of his significance before we turn specifically to look at his relationship with the Mortimers. So certainly Llewellyn was a very important, significant figure in 13th century Wales. Uh, and as his uh, epithet, the great, uh, makes clear. Now he was from the latest dynasty of Gwynedd, this dynasty that Eurin mentioned, that was very important in establishing the supremacy over uh, much of Wales. Um, he was the grandson of quite an important king of Gwynedd called Owain Gwynedd, who died in 1170, who'd managed to create a unified kingdom in Gwynedd. Um, the problem, however, um, well, one of his problems, that is that he had so many sons. He had 18 sons. Um, and after his death, um, this de did lead to some uh, conflict between uh, various members of his dynasty, so that his kingdom was divided uh, after his death. And into this situation, a few decades later, Llewellyn the Great, Llewellyn ab Yorwerth, uh, finds himself and intrudes himself onto the kingdom of his grandfather in Gwynedd. You can see the, the rough uh, area of Gwynedd, so most of, um, not just our, the, our modern day understanding of Gwynedd in the west, but also the north east. Um, and within a period of conflict, he first allied with his cousins against their uncles, uh, and then, once they'd got rid of their uncles, uh, he then turned on his cousins. Um, it's a quite normal occurrence uh, in 13th and 12th century Wales. Uh, and became ruler of the whole of Gwynedd by 1201. So he'd gone from being nearly an outsider at the beginning um, to becoming ruler uh, of the whole of Gwynedd, uniting the kingdom of his grandfather. But he then developed uh, his status, his authority, even further by engaging in a positive relationship with the King of England at the time. So this was King John. Um, to the point where Llewellyn married Joan, the daughter of the King. Uh, and of course, this um, was another marker of his importance and accepted importance in England uh, as well. And was developing to be one of the most preeminent pre rulers in, um, in Wales of his day. But he also had ambitions to build supremacy across other parts of the country, not just in his native kingdom of Gwynedd. Uh, and so over years, uh, he built a supremacy that included much of Wales under his authority. Um, so I've got a number of dates here, but bear with me. Just go quickly through some of the important things that happened in his reign. Um, so in 1208, he took advantage of the fact that one of his rivals, Gwen Winwin, already mentioned by David, um, uh, was arrested by King John. He took uh, Gwen Winwin's territory of Southern Powys and turned on Gwen Winwin's allies in other parts of Wales uh, and took Ceredigion as well. Um, there was a setback, uh, if we're honest, for Llewellyn in 1211 uh, when King John led a campaign uh, against Gwynedd uh, and nearly destroyed Llewellyn. But after 1211, suddenly what we see is the increasing uh, power uh, and increasing supremacy of Llewellyn uh, ab Iorwerth, uh, in Wales. Um, after his setback in 1211, he became the undisputed uh, leader uh, of Welsh rulers from 1212 onwards uh, and included, including sometimes, receiving support from his former enemies, such as Gwen Winwin. Um, what helped Llewellyn as well is that he made sure that he became significant within uh, broader European conflicts, the conflicts that were happening outside of Wales as well. Um, conflict between King John and Philip Augustus of France, conflict between John and the Pope, Innocent III, and Llewellyn made use of this conflict uh, in order to 
um, make sure that he could uh, take an advantage and secure his supremacy in Wales. Um, Alling with the barons uh, in the lead-up to uh, Magna Carta, um, leading campaigns in 1215 across different parts of Wales um, and building his supremacy in this sense. Um, in 1216, he captured Southern Powys for the second time and held on to the territory um, afterwards. Um, and his preeminence and certainly his supremacy in Wales was accepted by Henry III in the Treaty of Worcester in 1218. Now, there were plenty of uh, conflict happened after this, but from 1218 onwards, we see Llewellyn in a position of authority uh, and certainly being the preeminent ruler um, across uh, much of Wales. This map gives an indication of uh, the support uh, for him, the areas which he directly ruled, the areas of um, other Welsh rulers who were um, effectively subject um, to him. Um, Although, as we'll find out in a minute, his authority, authority extended further than we might see in this map into the area we're concerned about today, uh, the area of Mylianne, uh, or Radnership. Um, and Llewellyn kept this unity until his death in 1240. So certainly he's a significant individual um, who developed supremacy over the Wales, um, changed Welsh politics during his day, and certainly prepared the way for his grandson, uh, Llewellyn Ap Griffith, um, later in the century. So that's the first aspect uh, I wanted to cover in this lecture, um, just to provide some context to what I'm going to talk about next. So I'll turn now then to the conflict uh, and to the coexistence, to some extent, that existed between Llewellyn and the Mortimers. Now, uh, we've already heard from David Stevenson about the ob obsession of the Mortimer family with um, the land between Y and Seven. Um, but early in the 13th century, um, this area became significant for the ambitions of the princes of Gwynedd, um, such as Llewellyn and Yorworth, as they sought then to expand their supremacy. Now, I wouldn't say go as far as to say that the Llewellyn also had an obsession um, with this area, but certainly it was key to his ambitions. So just to remind you of the area uh, we're talking about here, so we've got Mylianne, um, the, the major part uh, of uh, this area that was fought over between uh, Llewellyn uh, and the Mortimers, uh, but we also have uh, Gorthyrnion or Gorthyrnion um, to the west, uh, and Comodeidor uh, further west as well, uh, and territories uh, around them. But Mylianne is certainly central to this story. Um, and as uh, David mentioned as well, this area was captured by uh, Roger Mortimer uh, in the 1190s. But what we see with Llewellyn uh, is that certainly early on, he had a clear interest in the march. Uh, so before he started to um, intervene specifically in Mylianne, he had an interest in the march generally. Um, it's likely that he was raised in the march. Um, so it's likely uh, that he, he was raised um, in course uh, in March of Lordship, uh, and it's from there that he then went on to uh, gain Gwynedd. So he might have been very familiar, certainly, with the politics and the people of the march. Um, and there are other events as well in which we see him being engaged in this area. Um, so um, we see, for example, he was involved with Gwen Winwin in the siege of Payne's Castle in 1198, so Payne's Castle in Elvile to the south of Mylianne. We also know that he uh, raised one of the uh, native dynasty of Mylianne in the period of Mortimer um, success in Mylianne. So Madog at Mailgun was raised in the court of Llewellyn. So again, another connection between Llewellyn and uh, this area. Um, and certainly he was starting to 
impose his um, authority and to expand his authority over this area um, by 1212, when he wrote a letter to so the Welsh lords in um, Malienid and surrounding area, uh, demanding that they should not, uh, they should desist from attacking the land of Ratlinghoe Priory in Shropshire. So we see that there was an increasing interest um, and, uh, by Llewellyn in this area. Um, but now, as Llewellyn from 1212 onwards is trying to develop his authority over um, part of Wales outside of his native kingdom of Gwynedd, um, we see him coming into conflict with the Mortimers over Mylianid. And in this period, we see um, the battle, uh, the feud, the rivalry between some of the lords of Mylianid, the Welsh lords of Mylianid, and the Mortimers being drawn in, um, others being drawn into this conflict. So well in, on the one hand, from Gwynedd, uh, and the King of England on the other. So it's changing from um, a private um, feud to becoming something that was more significant in the conflict between the Prince of Gwynedd and the King of England. Um, at this point in 1212, we see two of the uh, lords, Welsh lords of Maglienid, being executed, uh, being hanged uh, in um, Bridge North, so Howell ab Cadwallon and his nephew uh, Madog ab Milgun. Some of these Mortimer rivals were executed in 1212. They're described in the native chronicle, the chronicle of the princes, as men of eminent lineage and chief leaders of Wales. And Llewellyn at this point is starting his campaign in alliance with other Welsh rulers um, to overthrow the dominance of King John in different parts um, of Wales. And um, as part of this, Innesden III um, is, uh, raises the interdict. He'd placed England under interdict in his conflict with King John. He raises this interdict um, uh, in the lands of Llewellyn and in his allies, which might then include some of these lords, native lords of Mylianid. And Llewellyn then goes on his campaigns, and we see in the Chronicle of the Princes specifically names Maredith and Cadwallon at Milgun, um, the part of this native dynasty in Mylianid, as those who are going on campaigns with Llewellyn. Llewellyn also allied himself with other martial lords. Uh, in this case, the De Braos family. The De Braos family is certainly one of the most prominent martial lords apart from the Mortimers. Um, they were uh, in rebellion against John, and Llewellyn allies himself with Giles, De Braos, Bishop of Hereford, and Reginald uh, De Braos uh, as well. Uh, and in 1215, uh, as part of the conflict surrounding Magna Carta, uh, Llewellyn um, leads uh, and the de Breus capture Mylianid from the Mortimer family. They conquer Mylianid, uh, and Llewellyn um, um, takes possession um, of uh, Mylianid. Um, Knighton, uh, so he's captured as well as part of this campaign um, by um, Llewellyn. Uh, and Camaron Castle, you can see Camaron Castle here uh, on the screen, uh, is captured as part of that and destroyed as part of that campaign. And in 1218, in the Treaty of Worcester, um, Henry III acknowledges Llewellyn's conquests, which would include um, this area. He didn't confirm that Llewellyn had a right to them permanently, uh, but he acknowledged Llewellyn's possession of his conquests generally. Uh, and at this point, or some point from this, we see Llewellyn then installing some of the, uh, the dynasty of Cadwallon of Madog uh, as rulers in Mylianid under his uh, overlordship. So Llewellyn then had gained possession of this area. Um, however, we know already, 
of the Mortimer obsession. And from this point onwards, the Mortimers uh, were trying to regain uh, their control over this area uh, of Mylene. Uh, and as David mentioned, he, they do them in, in various legal ways, they try various legal means to try and regain uh, Mylene. Um, so, in 1216, uh, there's an attempt by Hugh Mortimer now, uh, who's now the, um, the Lord of Wigmore, um, to uh, try and get possession of the manors of Knighton uh, and uh, Norton. So, he's trying to start to rebuild the family's uh, fortunes in uh, Mylianid. Uh, however, um, he's ultimately unsuccessful and Llewellyn uh, retains his possession of uh, Knighton uh, at that point. And then in 1220, um, appealing to the royal court, Henry III demands to Llewellyn that he hands over Mylianid back to the Mortimer family, to Hugh uh, Mortimer. Um, and uh, Llewellyn and surprisingly uh, refuses. He's, he claims that he is uh, holding this land uh, and supporting his, his nephews, he calls them, um, the, uh, those rulers he'd installed in Mylianid. And ultimately, uh, Henry III and his council have to accept that Llewellyn uh, maintained in his possession uh, of Mylianid. Llewellyn basically says in his letter, if trouble is caused by this, it's not my fault. So he's sort of suggesting, I'm not going to create any trouble, but if you're trying to, gain, trying to regain my Leonid, um, this is, um, you know, trouble is going to happen. Um, and at this point, Llewellyn, as a very astute politician, um, treads a fine line in his relationship with Henry III, um, trying to keep, although there is conflict between uh, the Welsh and the martial lords at various points, he's keeping... Um, a good relationship with the king, and so the Mortimers therefore don't have that support to regain the land from Llewellyn. When Hugh Mortimer dies, Llewellyn is still in possession of Mylianid, and Hugh then is, um, is succeeded by his brother, Ralph Mortimer, <coughs> uh, who continues with this Mortimer obsession to regain the land of Mylianid. Uh, and we see this as part of the general success of Llewellyn at the time, that he's managing to hold his control of areas in Mylianid and the surrounding area. So, for example, um, in 1228, where there is a campaign by the Justicia of England, Hubert de Burr, uh, in Kerry, just to the north of Mylianid, um, in 1228, um, Llewellyn manages to defeat them and they have to destroy the castle that they'd built there. So this confirms Llewellyn's success, Llewellyn's authority in the area. And so there has been no success by the Mortimers uh, in um, trying to regain this territory and opposing uh, the dominance that Llewellyn had built up um, generally uh, in Wales. And so this is where we, we turn from conflict to coexistence. So I, I did promise some coexistence, uh, and this is the coexistence as opposed to all the conflict that had happened previously. Um, so in 1230, we need to get the marriage of Ralph Mortimer, so the Lord of Wigmore, to Gladys, who was the daughter of Llewellyn, um, the great Llewellyn of Yorworth. So an attempt to succeed, or at least retain, regain some power through marriage rather than through confrontation. And so they're another means uh, to achieve their uh, aims. Uh, and so we enter sort of a different phase to some extent to the relationship between Llewellyn uh, and the Mortimers. As though this, this doesn't mean that they're going to be friends uh, from this point uh, onwards. But there is some success for uh, Ralph Mortimer because part of this um, arrangement Llewellyn gives over Knighton uh, and Norton um, to Ralph Mortimer. He doesn't give him Elienid, but he gives him these estates, these manors of Knighton 
uh, and Norton. And so Ralph von Apices starts to regain his power uh, in uh, Mylianiv. Ralph rebuilds Knights and Castle. Um, when I was looking for images of Knights and Castle uh, online, this is what come up, came up. Um, so I, I'm quite sure that Ralph didn't build a Lego castle uh, in Knighton, but this Lego castle um, is called Knighton Castle. Um, so if you want to rebuild Ralph's castle, there is the opportunity for you to do so. Um, this is Knighton Castle. Um, so um, some attempts then by Ralph Mortimer to, re to rebuild his authority. But ultimately, he had to wait until Llewellyn's death um, to do so. And so the death of Llewellyn in 1240 was the opportunity for Ralph Mortimer um, to regain uh, Mylianne um, and receive the support of Henry III now to do this. Um, Llewellyn tried to pass on his territory, his authority intact to his son, David, um, but David, of course, didn't have the same authority, didn't have the same respect uh, at that point as his father, Llewellyn. Um, and so Henry III could certainly acknowledge David as heir to Gwynedd, but didn't acknowledge that David had any authority um, elsewhere. And so in 1241, there is warfare between uh, the Mortimers um, and uh, these lords of Mylianid, who ultimately had to submit to Henry III um, and could not keep Mylianid for themselves. Uh, and so Mortimer, in 1241, regained Mylianid with the other uh, territories such as Grothirnion uh, and Comodeidor um, to the west um, because, of now, because now they were not facing uh, the dominance of Llewellyn ab Iorwerth, Llewellyn the Great, uh, anymore. So we've seen the context um, of what uh, went on and the backdrop to these events in Mylianne. And we've also seen here um, the conflict, the history of the conflict between Llewellyn ab Iorwerth, Llewellyn the Great, uh, and the Mortimers for this area, um, Mylianne, um, between Y and Seven, the wider area, um, the, this Mortimer obsession with the area. Now, this conflict between uh, Llewellyn uh, and the Mortimers um, it certainly is a fascinating story, or at least I found it fascinating, fascinating um, uh, this, this conflict um, between them. But is it more than an interesting story? What can we learn from looking at this conflict and looking at the significance of Mylianid um, in this period? What does looking at Mylianid and the interaction between Llewellyn and the Mortimers reveal about Llewellyn, re reveal about his approach? Um, and uh, in proper tradition, I'm going even further now, and I have three points to talk about in my third point uh, as well. So I'm going to mention three things, three different aspects we can look at and learn about from looking at uh, this relationship between Llewellyn and the Mortimers. So the first point I want to look at is that looking at this conflict helps us to understand the place of Mylianne in Llewellyn's principality um, and the very nature of this principality, if you want to say in the commas, that Llewellyn was attempting to build in Wales. So we see this uh, Mylianne coming into the possession of Llewellyn as he's developing his supremacy over Wales. But what was the place then of Mylianne within this supremacy? Um, and it's easy for us, um, maybe looking back in hindsight and with our modern ideas often, to try and, and see that it's only natural for native rulers uh, or native families in Mylianne to, that they would, of course, support 
any attempt by a Welsh ruler to gain authority over them and to conquer the area um, from a family like the uh, Mortimers. You know, we think it would only be natural for the descendants of Cadwallon of Madog to want to be ruled by a Welsh prince such as Llewellyn. But of course, as David Stevenson has made very clear, this was not necessarily the case. Of course, these lords of Mylianid wanted to regain their land from the Mortimers. They wanted to be lords of Mylianid. But that didn't necessarily mean they wanted to be subservient to Gwynedd um, um, as part of this. Uh, and um, David Stevenson has already mentioned uh, this uh, in 1212, Madog at Milgun, in a charter to um, Cwm says that the people of Mylianid would not, or the upper crest of Mylianid, would not endure the rule of a prince over them. So a direct, uh, well, sort of a, um, a nearly direct reference to um, Llewellyn there. However, a few years later, Llewellyn had conquered Mylianid. And Madog's brothers, Madog was ex executed in the same year um, that he uh, wrote that charter, uh, but his brothers, Cadwallon and Moredi, were then installed in Melianin um, by Llewellyn to rule on his behalf. Um, so the native dynasty were uh, installed, but under Llewellyn's control. And Llewellyn had very clear things to say about his authority over Mylianid, which helps us to understand his authority in Wales generally. In 1220, when responding to the Henry III's request that he should hand over Mylianid to the Mortimers, Llewellyn claimed that he gave homage to the king, and he did give homage to the king, but he gave homage on behalf of the lords of Mylianid, that the homage of Mylianid, the lords of Mylianid, owed their homage to Llewellyn, and that he then, that, that Mylianid was part of his principality. Uh, that is what he claimed, that Mylianid belonged to his principality, um, and that it was nothing to do with Henry III, only in so far that Llewellyn himself gave homage to the king on behalf of his whole principality. Um, and we see similar things happening uh, with Llewellyn further south. So later on, uh, there's an individual called Owain ap Meredith, um, who is in control of the northern part of Elvile, to the south of Meliani, uh, so Elvile Ilchmanin. Uh, and Llewellyn uh, also um, you know, develops this idea that Owain ap Meredith holds his land from Llewellyn as part of Llewellyn's Principality. Now, in Llewellyn's dealing with Mylianid and with the lords of Mylianid, we certainly see an idea of uh, what has been termed confederation, an alliance of rulers working together for a common purpose. Um, Llewellyn brought these various rulers, including the native dynasty of Mylianid, together on campaign, um, he counselled them, he gave them aid. Um, and we see this idea of confederation in the letter between Llewellyn, that Llewellyn sent to the King of France, Philip Augustus, uh, in an alliance that Llewellyn developed with the King of France. Um, you can see in bold there, Llewellyn refers to all the princes of Wales in unanimous confederation and talks about all the princes of Wales' request that Philip, uh, and so on. So this idea that Llewellyn is the leader of a, uh, of a confederation of um, Welsh um, rulers. But Llewellyn wanted to go further, and we see this very clear in the way he writes about Mylianid. It was also a matter of over lordship. He, the, he installed members of, the, of a dynasty, Melianid, to rule on his behalf. 
Llywelyn had this idea of a united principality based on all the other rulers, Welsh rulers, paying homage to him and becoming his vassals. So like the situation of the kings, the king in England and his barons. Um, he wanted this formally acknowledged by the king, this idea of a principality, but this was not um, to be. Uh, Henry would not accept that Llewellyn uh, or, um, possessed the homage of all the rulers uh, of um, Wales. Um, but this is an idea that Llewellyn was uh, developing that was not realised by Llewellyn himself. Um, but we see the idea in the way he describes and talks about Malienid. Um, and certainly we see this idea realised by his grandson, Llewellyn Ap Griffith. So, we've, so one thing we can learn then is the position of Malienid in the Principality and the whole concept of the Principality. The second point is that looking at Malienid helps us to understand the way Llewellyn ruled and the way he exercised power. So the way the power was exercised by Welsh rulers was quite different by the 13th century to what we saw Eirin describing uh, earlier in the 11th century. Uh, it's not about raiding and pillaging and eliminating your rivals anymore. But Llewellyn, we see, be more willing to accommodate other rulers under his authority rather than killing or expelling them. Um, and Llewellyn also, um, as we see with other Welsh rulers at the time, was developing um, new methods of governing that were the norm across Europe at the time developing uh, a more highly um, sophisticated um, administrative system, bureaucracy, using university-trained clerics um, to, um, to work in his, um, uh, in his administration, um, being a patron of religious houses, building castles. Do we see this at all in Mailienid? Well, when it comes to religious houses, of course, the important religious house in Mailianid is come here. Llewellyn was an important patron of religious houses in Gwynedd, such as Abraconwy, Cymer. He realised their importance politically, economically, of course, as well as spiritually. And the suggestion has been made that we, we see him as um, um, using this method as well in Mailianid when it comes to come here. Cumhir was an important abbey for both the Mortimers and, the, and uh, some of the native rulers of Mailiennid. It was founded by Cadwallon of Madog, but he's received patronage from the Mortimer family uh, as well. Um, and um, one of the things to note is the impressive scale of the name of the church in Cumhir. Um, so 242 feet long, it, it was planned to be longer even than Westminster Abbey. Um, and the idea has been put forward that um, Llewellyn um, was a patron of Cumhir, that he uh, made sure that, that Cumhir was built on an impressive scale as a sort of national cathedral um, for the principality he was developing. Um, however, um, David Stevenson um, has um, more recently argued uh, that it's more likely that it was Roger Mortimer who was responsible for the impressive building work uh, in, uh, my, in Combe here. So it's an intriguing possibility, but looking unlikely. Um, certainly, uh, David Stevenson argues very effectively that it's probably Roger Mortimer who was responsible for the building work in Combe here. So we don't see him as a patron of religious houses here. But what about castles? Um, we know that Llewellyn was important in, develop, in building impressive stone castles in Gwynedd, such as Castell de Berre, you see on the screen here. Um, and it has been um, certainly, certainly a possibility, um, it's likely that Llewellyn had been involved in building castles in Malienne. So Kenthis, we've already heard, rebuilt by the Mortimers, but possibly originally built by Llewellyn. And this idea of building castles within other parts of the um, 
of his principality, not just within his original core kingdom of Gwynedd, is something that his grandson, Llewellyn of Griffin, picked up um, later. And the final point, okay, I've got two minutes left, so I'll be quick, and the final point I want to make is that looking at this conflict or coexistence between um, Llewellyn and the Mortimers helps us to understand the role of both conflict and coexistence generally in the march. There was plenty of conflict, um, a lot of fierce contention for Maelianid, uh, as we see generally between Llewellyn and March Lords. But it wasn't all like this, as is symbolised in the marriage of Gladys, Llewellyn's daughter, to Ralph Mortimer. Um, the Welsh princes and the March Lords could also be allies and could cement their relationships through marriage. Llewellyn made extensive use um, of marriage. Uh, it helped that he had a number of daughters and that he generally married, well, he often married them to old men who he, he then, after they passed away, he could remarry his daughters to other March Lords uh, afterwards. So he sort of, um, could make, um, so from, for every daughter, he could probably use marriage twice uh, in each case. Um, this is a list of Llewellyn's children, um, not all of them, but those who married um, into Marcher families. Um, and you see Gladys, poor Gladys, appears there twice on the list. She was the first, as far as we know, of his daughters married to a Marcher lord. Um, married to Reginald Bros in 1215, at that point, Rob Reginald Bros uh, rebelling against King John, one of Llewellyn's major allies, this is cemented by marriage. Um, later, though, uh, Reginald de Bros, um, um, in a way, left his alliance with Llewellyn, and so, so Llewellyn then married another daughter, Marared, to John de Bros, Lord of Gower, um, who was Reginald's rival in the family. So we've got sort of marrying one daughter to one side of the conflict and his do another daughter to the other side. Um, then, a daughter, Ellen, was married to John the Scot, the heir to the earldom of Chester, so having a firm ally on the east of his kingdom of Gwynedd. He married Gwenllian to William de Lacy. Um, so the William de Lacy was um, brother to Hugh de Lacy, Earl of Ulster, and um, to Walter, Earl of Meath. Um, so lords in Ireland, but they were also martial lords. Um, so Ludlow um, and further, you can see on this map, does this work? No. Um, but you can see the Browse lands just to the south of Mylianid. You can see the Lacey, um, some of the Lacey territory to uh, further eastwards. And then um, Clifford, I'm going to mention Clifford, Marared was remarried to Walter Clifford. You can see Clifford uh, as well, not as clearly, but to um, on the eastern flank uh, as well. Um, Llewellyn married his son David, the only son he married, um, to a, uh, a family of martial lords. David married uh, Isabella, the daughter of uh, William um, de Bros, um, and part of her dowry, Bilf, um, came into Llewellyn's possession. Um, and so you can see the benefit of these marriage alliances. Um, this wasn't without its complication because, in port, of course, in 1230, uh, when the marriage discussions were taking part, Llewellyn discovered his wife was having an affair with William de Bros. Um, William de Bros was executed, was uh, hanged by Llewellyn, a martial lord being hanged by Llewellyn. But, of course, this didn't stop the marriage from taking place. And so the marriage still continues because it was still so important, even though the father of the groom had executed the father of the bride. Um, <laughs> But you see the, the importance of these alliances to Llewellyn, um, building effectively a buffer zone around his, his principality that he was trying to build, including, of course, much of them around Mylianid um, as well, um, and developing a tra trying to develop a stable situation in the march. Now, this is one aspect in which he wasn't emulated by his grandson, um, who as far as we know, only had one daughter born six months before he died. So Llewellyn, the last, um, wasn't, uh, didn't use this policy in the same way. 
So just to finish then, what we see is the importance of this area for the Mortimers, but also for Llewellyn and his ambitions for a principality. And is central to helping us understand the politics, not just of the March, but of Wales and also of England uh, in the early 13th century. Thank you.